glycan uh, suggests that there's carbohydrate involved, like glucose or glycerol, and that would be correct. So peptidoglycan is a mix of uh, amino acids and carbohydrates. Um, and in gram-positive bacteria, uh, there's a single peptidoglycan layer that is found external to the plasma membrane. So we've got a plasma membrane of phospholipids, just like all organisms have, that forms the boundary of the, uh, the cell. Uh, and external to that, we might have uh, this peptidoglycan layer, which forms the wall of the cell. So in gram-positives, this peptidoglycan layer is what's facing the environment, what absorbs that gram stain. Uh, in gram-negative bacteria, most gram-negative bacteria, uh, they have an additional membrane layer outside of the cell wall. And that additional uh, membrane layer outside the cell wall prevents the stain from uh, adhering to the peptidoglycan, which is why they don't uh, look as dark and purple. So in some uh, bacteria, they will have uh, this outer membrane in our gram-positive, uh, gram-negatives, uh, and they might have something that in this illustration kind of looks like grass growing on a lawn, but these are actually lipopolysaccharides, or uh, carbohydrates, uh, chains of carbohydrates with uh, fats, lipids attached to them, fatty acids. And some of these lipopolysaccharides can be uh, important toxins, uh, important in the sense that uh, if they if you consume them, they can make you very sick or even kill you. Uh, very important uh, toxins from uh, these gram-negative bacteria. Uh, in addition to that, sometimes uh, some uh, types of bacteria will produce another layer, uh, sort of a chemical layer external to the cell wall called a capsule. And the capsule, as you can see here, uh, is outside of that cell wall. And its function is, it's kind of slimy or mucus-like, and it enables bacteria to adhere to a certain substrate. So if they're, for example, a pathogenic bacterium, they can help them stick to the, uh, the host cells in the system so that they can stay attached and... Uh, derive nutrition from their host while they're causing disease. Uh, fimbriae uh, comes to us from the Latin word that means fringe. And fimbriae are, they look kind of like cilia or like flagella, but they are not the same as cilia or flagella. Cilia are only found in eukaryotic cells. Uh, flagella are uh, different in their structure. Um, from the fimbriae, but it means fringe in Latin. Uh, and these also can help a bacterium anchor itself to a substrate, either a host or uh, a grain of sand if it's a soil bacterium or clay or what have you. Uh, that's something else that we can see those fimbriae and we know we've got a certain type of, uh, in this case, bacillus. Uh, pili, or if you just have one, a pilus, or a pili, are, uh, they're kind of like straws. They're kind of like, uh, they're uh, cylindrical, hollow tubes that can connect bacteria to each other. Uh, and sometimes they're called a sex pilus because they can transmit genetic information in the form of loops of DNA from one bacterium to another. So what we can see here is this is a donor cell which is giving some type of uh, plasmid or genetic signal to a recipient cell through this long tube here. Uh, bacteria may also have flagella. If we just have one flagellum, we call it a flagellum. If we have two or more, they are a flagella. If we have ten, they're still flagella. Uh, it, but the structure of prokaryotic flagella uh, 
is very different from what we see in eukaryotic flagella. We talked about eukaryotic flagella in biology 1020, and we know that it is constructed of predominantly microtubules that drive those flagella, uh, that are the, the microtubules are cross-linked by motor proteins, but what we see in bacterial flagella is very different. So here we've got uh, a peptidoglycan cell wall, we've got a plasma membrane, and here is the machinery that drives the, um, the flagellum of a bacterium. And it doesn't have that 9 plus 2 arrangement of microtubules uh, inside a hollow uh, structure. You've got a lot of different uh, types of uh, proteins that are involved in the bacterial flagellum. So flagella, we can say, are uh, similar in that there are both these whip-like structures that are found on the surface of cells, but they are not similar based on shared structure or shared common ancestry per se. So they are not homologous structures. So we can see, say that the flagella of uh, prokaryotes and eukaryotes are homoplasious or analogous. Just so happens it's useful to have this whip-like structure to help you with your motility. Uh, and both prokaryotes and eukaryotes have them, but not by shared common ancestry. Uh, speaking of moving around, some bacteria are capable of doing so, and they do it through a process called taxis, not by getting into taxis, but uh, this word is taxis, which refers to movement towards or away from a stimulus. If it's movement towards a stimulus, it's positive taxis. If it's movement away from a, a stimulus, it's negative taxis. Uh, and we can put prefixes in front of this word taxis, that indicate whether uh, what type of uh, stimulus is directing the movement. So positive phototaxis is movement towards light, which might be useful if you're a photosynthetic organism. Uh, you need to go to where the light is in order to feed yourself. Uh, negative chemotaxis would be movement away from a chemical signal. So chemo uh, refers to chemical, and negative means away from. So this might be something like uh, a toxin, or a poison, or uh, an antibiotic, which is really a toxin or a poison for bacteria. As far as how their DNA is arranged, their genome is arranged, we know that prokaryotes don't have a nucleus, so they don't have a whole bunch of linear chromosomes. Rather, they have a single circular chromosome, and it's kind of circle in the sense that it's a loop, uh, but you're not going to look inside of a bacterium, even with a uh, high-resolution uh, transmission electron microscope, and see just a big circle of DNA. What you're going to look like is, it looks like the, uh, the bacterium put its, its headphones in its pocket and uh, it turned into a twisted mess in there. But we know that it is a continuous loop, uh, and when we find that uh, loop of DNA, that sort of wad of DNA, uh, it is arranged in what is called the nucleoid, or it looks like a nucleus, it's not a nucleus, it's not bounded by a membrane. But there can also be other elements, genetic elements, loops of DNA that are smaller, uh, called plasmids. And plasmids are kind of like peripheral or additional bits of genetic information that uh, bacteria might use. Uh, all of the genes that are absolutely essential are going to be found within that uh, large chromosome, within the nucleoid. But certain other characteristics can be picked up by bacteria by uh, gaining plasmids. Something very important to remember with bacteria and archaea is that they do not go through mitosis or meiosis. Their cell division is very different. It's called binary fission. Uh, how is it different from mitosis or meiosis? Uh, in a lot of ways, but if you can remember how mitosis and meiosis work, one of the first things that happens in, in mitosis for uh, most organisms is the nuclear envelope breaks down. And in the case of 
prokaryotes, that's just not possible. They don't have a nuclear envelope. Uh, so mitosis is not a universal process, uh, nor is binary fission. But this binary fission as a mode of uh, reproduction uh, is asexual. It does not increase genetic variability inherently. Uh, but we know that prokaryotes are a very diverse group of organisms, and how do they come to be that way in the absence of sex? Uh, and one way, the main way that that's accomplished, is so, through something called horizontal gene transfer, uh, where genetic information is passed from one cell to another cell, so from one cell to a sister cell, rather than from a mother cell to a daughter cell. Uh, and there are a number of ways that horizontal gene transfer can occur. Uh, one way is through transformation. And transformation is when bacteria pick up a loop of DNA or genetic information directly from their environment. Now, how would they do that? Is there, are there just little loops of DNA everywhere? Um, it's not that we get plasmids from inorganic sources, but imagine that uh, soil bacterium uh, is near a site where uh, many cells have just died, they ruptured, and all of their contents are sort of spilled about on the scene, and bacteria can pick up plasmids just from that area without having to get it from an intact, live uh, bacterial source. Uh, when they use sex pili, they, that is a process called conjugation. So that's where uh, two live cells can exchange plasmids. Uh, transduction is another way for genetic information to be transferred from uh, bacteria, and that is mediated by viruses. So bacteria have their own sets of viruses that they can transmit uh, to each other, and that process, uh, we know from the experiments of Hershey and Chase, that DNA can be injected into a bacterial cell, leaving the protein coat behind, um, and that uh, loop, that uh, nucleic acid molecule will, can be transcribed and translated by the bacterium that is uh, receiving that particular virus.